Welcome everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Clean Shah, who will be speaking on topological data analysis based machine learning for drug design. Yeah. Uh, thank Henry for the invitation and uh, thank the audience for coming. So today I'm going to talk about this uh, TDA applications. So it's actually some uh, related to, to the recent progress in this AI-based drug design and the drug discovery. So this is uh, the new area that actually recently get a lot of progresses. And this progress are usually uh, majorly due to the uh, development in three areas. So first one is really about the biomedical data. So uh, there's a huge accumulation of this biomedical data in the past uh, several decades. So one of them is this uh, uh, P2P data. So we have uh, currently, we have more than 170,000, uh, 178,000 these data is accumulated here. Let me try to draw you to uh, make sure this one is not blocking. Maybe put it here. Yeah. So another, another big uh, area is for this gene data. So currently, there are two, more than uh, 220 million of this gene sequence accumulated in the data bank. And getting the gene information is super easy now. So actually my wife, I just test this, like a, this 23 and me website, and then you just use like 100 US dollars and then you can get all your gene information. And during this pandemic, I think we know that right to, to, to see if you have the, you know, very bad luck to get COVID-19, you have to do the PCR test. And this PCR test is extremely uh, quick and fast and uh, you can do easily like millions of people uh, for this test. So this again, help to accumulate a gigantic amount of data. So that's the area one. The other reason is really about the computational power. So in 1972, this is a story I like the most. In 1972, Apollo 11 had a help a human, you know, first landed in the moon. But at that time, the central CPU system for Apollo 11 is only have this something RAM, this random access memory about 4 KB. And then ROM is read only memory is about 72 KB. So if you don't know about this stuff, it's roughly just two index for the CPUs. And now, the CPU, the for the for the CPU we have in the iPhone, you can easily go to four gigabyte and eight gigabyte or seventeen gigabyte if you have enough money, right? So that means the iPhone in our everybody's hand now is about millions times more powerful than the computer that helped human body land in the moon in 1970. So huge progress has been really happened in the past 50 years. And the third aspect is really about the, the, uh, the powerful learning models. So I don't need to go to detail as many people are already familiar, you know, a lot of machine learning, manifold learning, deep learning, all these data driven the learning model have helped the researchers to find out interesting patterns in the data. Well, mathematically, when we're looking at these learning models, what are the central issue here is really about how to learn the data representation and the features within the data. So to look at a very simple example here. So uh, this is the Obama and dog. They share the same facial expression. I think people can get a joke here. Uh, so so, so for, for, for if we want the computer to learn this, or if you want the computer to find out the guys have the same facial expression, what should we do here? Usually it involves two steps. First one is that we have to have a certain representation for the data. This representation can be any mathematical model, graphs and visual context, you know, certain function or a certain geometrical models. And then based on these representations, we have to learn certain features. These features are usually from, you know, something like a statistical properties, the mathematical invariant or any other quantitative measurement. And uh, this measurement can be used to characterize this abstract you know, definition of expression. And when you have these features uh, properly set, and then the problem will be well-defined and well-solved. And we know that this convolution neural network is a very powerful model that is significant around the study of images. And the reason why this CM model is so powerful can be simply understood as that they have the ability to do the feature learning automatically. So simply speaking, uh, we know that, you know, if we have an imaging, we have something called a kernel here, less than like 555 kernel. This one can be understood as a feature generator. 
So if we have a certain value here, we do a convolution with the imaging, then we get into a feature. We change this value and then we get another feature, so on and so forth. So we can get a series of features that we uh, obtained from the original image. And then these features can be further combined and uh, uh, abstract together into higher level features, which has been fed into the fed into the final result and compiled with the experimental data. Right. And then we see, okay, something is wrong. Then we do the backward propagation, get rid of features that are, are not irrelevant and keep the features that are important. So through this automatic feature generation and selection process, the CN can really solve the deep challenging problem for this imaging analysis. So uh, we are interested in the biomolecules because we want you to do the uh, to drug design. So these single models, however, cannot be directly used in this business because the images are comparably easy, right? Like this one here, they, are, they have the same size and then the values is usually like a zero to 255. But for the molecules, they are much, much complicated. They can have different atoms, they have different types of atom, and then to make things more complicated is that they have these 3D structures and the, which is directly related to their functions. So CNs tend to fail in these situations. So people in this biomolecular community, what they try to do is trying to come up with certain, what they call a feature engineering process. That is to generate certain molecular or chemical descriptors. So these descriptors actually there are more than 5,000 of these things that are like a big, Seek book of all these kind of descriptors has been done in these areas. So they are usually come from like a physical properties, but a majority of them come from the structure. Okay, so actually like 80 or 80 or 90 percent of them are used from the fish uh, the structure. The reason for that is because the molecules are just like the, our everyday object, they have something called a structure function, uh, the, the quantitative structure activity relationship. Simply speaking, the function of the molecules are highly determined by its structures. Just like you know, we design the table, we design the trail in this special structure so that they can fulfill their function. See, uh, so in the molecules, the structures are also highly or directly determined their functions. Therefore, a lot of these molecular descriptors are obtained from these uh, you know, structure properties. So we have like a zero D, we should just count the atoms and then the bonds and then one D, they have the fragmented certain uh, function motif and then two D usually is defined from the graph. In the graph, they have different kind of indexes, you know, uh, certain air region of the distances, so on and so forth. And then they have the three D, but this usually goes into the surface or, or density models. And then they have several indexes from them. And four D, which is considering the dynamic process. So you have more than one configurations, how you generate certain properties from this uh, time related process as a feature for the molecules. And then there are even more, all kinds of these fingerprint based on graph or certain uh, topological representations. So as a mathematician, when we see all these features here, I think we can immediately ask, it is possible that uh, there are some features or certain descriptors that are more intrinsic, more fundamental, or these uh, properties capture the more uh, fundamental properties of the structure. So that immediately goes in the TPA, right? Because topology essentially studying these general intrinsic properties, and then they can be used to analyze the structure properties. So I don't need to go to the details about the process of homology. So everybody here, I think, quite familiar with that and then the barcode information. So one of the difference is that our group is the first to propose that uh, actually in every, for every single bars in this barcode, it has very strong or direct physical meaning if our data is this molecular data from the experimental result. Okay, so if your data is like a, this common 16 or molecular that directly from the result, then each of the bars here, no matter short or long, they will have very clear or precise physical meanings. So they differently, there's no noise in these, model, in these models. So let's take this carbon 16 as an example. So this is a typical free molecular that are widely used now in this you know, cell, uh, uh, in the cells that, that are for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the battery of the cars. So uh, this one is made of six zero carbon and uh, uh, it formed this cage structure. So inside is hollow. 
And then the surface, on the surface, they have like a 12 pentagon and a 20 hexagon structures. Okay, and the, this is the this is the illustration. These are some of the bonds. So if you check about the Betty zero bars, you count the number, there are exactly six zero bars representing six zero atoms. And then these bars are classified into two types. Why is this short bar about 1.3 astron? So astron is about 10 to the negative 10 uh, meters. So it's 0.1 nanometers. Okay, so this one is 1.38, this one is 1.42. So what are these things? This length is actually directly corresponding to the, uh, this one corresponding couple, couple, double bond. This is a carbon, carbon single bond. Okay, the single bond is well, because it's weaker, so it's longer. And then the double bond is stronger, so it's shorter. It's only like 1.38 astrons. And then we have this 31 bars. If you check, we have the shorter ones. It's about uh, 11 of them. And the longer ones, it's about 20 of them. So they are corresponding exactly to the 12 pentagon and the 20 hexagon structures. Since we are using the Viatoris Vix complex, we have another some short bars here actually from the uh, hexagon structures. And then we have these long persistent bars, which represent the, the big void in this structure. So you see every bars here, the starting, the ending, and the length have its exact physical meanings. So no lois exists in this structure. And actually this barcode here, later we are using it as a fingerprint to precisely characterize the molecular structures. So another example we can check more clearly is this isomers. So the isomers, what that what it, what it means is actually, for example, here this is carbon-14. So we have, they are all made of four, uh, 14, uh, 14 carbon atoms and they all form this cage structure. So they all form this like sphere, the surface structure. And on, on top of it, they also have the similar number of pentagon and hexagons. However, their structures are slightly different because the, 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 the curvatures or the curving part on, on the surface are slightly different. And in this way, they will contribute a slightly different barcode. And actually, if we just check about the two bars, the length of it uh, can be very well matched with their total curvature energy. The idea is actually very simple. So if they are very regular, that means they have very uh, small, they have small curvature in the whole surface. In this way, they have a uh, lower total curvature. If they are more isotropic, like the ones here, they have like a big like a tipping region here. This one have large curvatures, and then they will have a higher total curvature energy. But this one, you see the battery two bars are actually smaller because they are more isentropic. You just use this idea, you can see that they are corresponding to the total energy very well. And another take home message is that every bus here matters exactly. And uh, using this idea, we are trying to uh, pl uh, play a little bit more game and we are trying to see the, the what are the, the barcode looks like, what are the fingerprint looks like for biomolecules. So for proteins, they are actually made of two types of secondary structure, what they call alpha helix, like the ones here, and another one is beta sheet. So these are the two essential structures for proteins. And we check about their barcode properties. So here we take the CR atom, we will see that they're actually very regular. All the beta zero bars are stopped and the 3.8 astron. And then the beta one bars are all uh, concentrated and reaching around five astrons. So each of these short bars here is actually formed by the adjacent four C alpha atoms. So you have four C alpha atoms, you contribute a bar, you add one more, so you have two set of these four uh, uh, atoms. So you have two bars, so on and so forth. Same thing for the beta sheet, for this beta sheet, they form this big uh, you know, channel type of structure. So you see there's a very long persistent bars and then all the others, the adjacent four can contribute a, a uh, small cycle. So you can see many of the cycle and this five, around this five electrons, very similar to this structure. And the more interesting is for this DNA. So we know that DNA is this double helix structure. If you take the good, uh, you know, suitable representation here, we just get rid of the hydrogen atom. You will see that the bars actually can be separated into two regions. This part, you know, is come earlier in the filtration. This part come later in the filtration. That's a clear separation of them in the, in the barcode. And uh, if you go to a little bit of details, these bars here are actually corresponding exactly to the pentagon and the hexagon regions in the nuclear acid because DNA is made of different, uh, 
four type of this nuclear asset, AG and G and C, and they all made of pentagon and hexagon structure that are slightly different. And all this information can be well captured in these regions. If you have different DNA structures, this one will show di uh, different components. You have to show different uh, barcodes here in this local region. And more interestingly is that they have this, what they call a minor and major growth. Minor growth means these two here, they are a little bit closer. And then this one, this one here, they are a little bit larger. And also between the two base pair, you pair of base pairs, they have this certain region here. And this is more related to global structure and then bars are exactly located here. So using this representation, it's just like a fingerprint for different DNAs. So you do have, so for example, two people have different DNAs, then they will contribute very different barcodes here. And we try to use this barcode as a fingerprint to characterize the system, to, 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 to mod model the systems. So that's the idea we do here. So the first thing uh, we play is uh, for this protein folding. So the folding is very important because the ear folding process can lead to like Parkinson's disease, medical disease, and you know, um, Alzheimer's diseases. So uh, starting this folding is a key issue in the family uh, in the biological science. So here we use something called a steel molecular dynamic. So we get our experimental data here, and then we use the force to drag them apart. So essentially we have broken the structures and make the structures uh, evolved into a straight line. So you have a well-folded structure because I've applied force manually on it and then it get, in the, uh, get un, uh, un, unfolded and then gradually evolved into a straight line. So during this process, we take about 100, uh, 1,000 configurations and upload the barcode. And then this is the result. Actually, you will see that the Betty zero does not change that much because here Betty zero corresponds to the covalent bond that not change but Betty 1 and Betty 2, they are significantly different. So you see Betty 1 here is much larger, more than 100, goes to 100, and then this is 60, and then 40, Betty 2 reduce even more. So to, to see this more clearly, they're actually using the Betty curve, right? So we add all these bars together, and they end into this Betty curve, and then we have 1,000 configuration. We just piece them together. So this is the starting configurations and then gradually unwound along the y direction. So you will see that some of the patterns are very consistent. Some of the patterns are changing a lot. So we have made a video for this process. So again, originally it's well-folded process, and then it gradually get unwound and then become a straight line. So this is the corresponding Betty 0, Betty 1, and Betty 2. X axis is for the filtration. Y axis is the evolution, it's the dynamic uh, along the dynamic time, okay? So you will see that around 700 configuration are actually a huge jumping in this Betty 1 and Betty 2 bars. So this actually corresponds to the region that the whole structure evolved into a straight line, okay? And this information, and more interestingly, you can see that some of this information does not change that much. So this one are actually corresponding to the to the structures, the local structures, what they call the uh, amino acid residues in the in the structure, they don't change that much. But the global structure changes a lot. These informations can be used to do some classification. And the more interesting thing is that they end up into an image. So if they end up into an image, then later they can be better combined with learning models. So we are get to that later. Another example we we do is for this what they call a hydrogen bonding network. So essentially. The, the our, 16 to 19 percent of our cell is made of water. But water is polar, meaning that we have oxygen with positive charge and hydrogen. Uh, sorry, uh, oxygen is negative charge and hydrogen is positive charge. So in this way, they actually form a very complicated uh, network in the liquid state. Okay, in the in the in the ice stage, uh, in the in the solid stage, they are a little bit regular, but in the liquid stage, it's very uh, complicated. So here, and to make things more even, uh, even more complicated, it was we have ions in it, right? We have the sodium chloride every day, and then these ions goes into the water, and then they interact with the water atom to make it even more complicated. But these things are so important because any biological interaction is happening in this solvation environment. So understanding the solvation environment is of key importance for any biological reaction. So here, what we do is that instead of using a graph, we go into some visual complex representation and study the barcode. So we have to check 
two systems, one is NACL, one is KSCN, and then we see the ion concentration. Uh, we try to increase the ion concentration until it's fully saturated, and then we see what are the patterns they form from these ions. So you see NACL and KSCN actually show different patterns. NACL, here they, they have this local structure and a global structure and then certain separation. And then KSCN, they are more highly, uh, you know, uh, connected with each other. The reason is actually NACL, they form a certain local cluster. Okay, this local cluster is of great importance biologically. We'll get to that later. And more importantly, is we study the correspondent hydrogen networks. So here, what we do is that we get rid of all the ions on NACL and KSCN. We just check about the hydrogen network and then see what are the patterns. So again, with the increasing of the concentrations, the NACL seems that not change that much. So this is the Betty one bars. For the KSDN, these are the corresponding Betty one bars. So you see, they actually have much larger variations. To see it more clearly, we again check about the Betty curve. So for NACL, with the increasing of concentration, there are only slight decrease of these peak values. But for KSDN, there's a dramatic decrease of the peak value and then the increase here. Actually, these are not the unique situation for these two ions. So the NACL and the KSCN, they contribute differently uh, in their biological functions. NACL tend to break the protein structures, so they call it structure breaking. And the KSCN is in the structure making. So if you have enough of NACL in the structure to destroy, you add some more KSCN, then the protein can you know, get better uh, into the original state. So it's, so. Simply speaking, NACL is the nature. This one is trying to preserve the nature. And the, what we found is that this urine and the TML, this is what they call the osmolite molecular, they have the same effect. So we want to see, okay, if they have the same effect, do they contribute the same topological structure? So we have to do the experimental, uh, the, the MD simulation. So here's the result. So uh, with the urine, with the increasing of concentration, again, the corresponding hydrogen boundary work has a very slight change. There's a uh, slight decrease of the peak value, but for TMAO, there's a dramatically uh, uh, decrease of the of the values. Well, very similar pattern to this NACL and the KSCN. Okay, so that means that these topological systems can characterize these intrinsic topological structures uh, within the systems. And another thing is that we we try to you know play with a little bit of, you know weighted structure in the in the boundary operator and then use it to classify certain um, you know A B Z DNAs and also the DNAs in different ion uh, concentrations. So here I just quickly jump into uh, jump over that. What we try to do here is again to use this barcode as a fingerprint and then use this fingerprint to see if they can connect it with certain biological uh, properties, trying to establish certain topolog uh, topology function relationship to see if our topological information can be directly used to, uh, to deduct or to find, to identify certain functions. Now we jump to another thing, of, uh, what we do is for the TDA-based learning models. So again, as we said in the previous, the TDA can, can be helped to generate a lot of these features. And then these features can be input into learning models. Again, if we have various data, you can have a different way of this visual complex generation or topology generation. And then you can use the barcode representation or dynamic or you know, like a persistent imaging by Henry and so on and so forth, and then combine with the learning models. So in fact, uh, Professor Wei, my collaborator, and the former advisor has already done a lot of work in these areas. So, uh, the TDA-based learning model has been applied to various problems in drug design, including binding affinity, this log P log S prediction, certain mutation, uh, you know, situation just like the COVID-19. Now we have a lot of mutation. This model can also be used to do that. So a lot of the models have been has been uh, a lot of the existing data can be used to extensively validate the models. And the, what you can see here is that the topological models not only working but consistently better than all the existing models in these areas, okay? And another thing is this these three are world competition. So this is just like the uh, Olympic competition in the drug design. Many people, so what they do is that they have this experimental data and then they hold it, they don't publish it. And then all the other teams comes in using their model to do the prediction. 
So see if they can match with the experimental data. Many of the groups there are actually from biochemistry and bioinformatics. So this GOES model has actually delivered a very good results. So you see one of the medal here, gold medal here means it ranked first in this series of competition. So, you know, a lot of gold medal there, it's not an easy work. And it's really demonstrated great power of this TDA based uh, visualization. To just give a little bit, you know, background or understanding of why these TDA models can have or have the potential to beaten the existing models or outperform the existing model, I think we can view it from three aspects. First one is that all the traditional models for molecular structures, they trying to model it using graph. Okay, they, they only have the atom atom pair interactions. And then based on this pair interaction, they have all kinds of measurement, low degree, shortest part, page rank, cluster, aggregate value, so on and so forth. But all these things, again, is only measuring pairwise interactions. TDA is powerful because they are based on simplicial context. If we are talking about simplicity, we immediately have this simplex two, simplex three, which revealed many body interactions. So it's like three body or four body interactions. So this information are taken into the consideration. That's the reason it can outperform certain graph based model. Another very important reason is that uh, TDA models use intrinsic environment like fatty lumber or uh, in fact, along this slide, you can consider many other intrinsic uh, invariant in topology or in geometry, such as all the characteristics, homology, cohomology, load polynomial, so on and so forth. In intrinsic invariant, they are more fundamental. In this way, they have better transferabilities for machine learning models. But if you want to have a better performance in learning models, you always want to, uh, you always want the features can be able to transport from one system to another system. So in this way, you prefer your feature to be more fundamental, more intrinsic. In this way, it have better transferabilities. And then the third reason is multi-scale. Every molecular system is multi-scale. So if you only use one, uh, one structure to, to characterize it, you miss a lot of the important information. For example, the electron uh, interactions are in the 12 astrons. The bound interactions are usually one to two astrons. So it's very hard for you to say, okay, one, this graph rep Present all the interaction, uh, all the important interaction in your system. So the multi, uh, you know, scaled representation is really of great importance. So based on these understandings, we recently proposed several different, uh, we call the persistent uh, functions. Also, you know, uh, a lot of help with the discussion with Massimo's. So we first we check about something called persistent spectrum. So we know that there's a graph, uh, spectrum graph, which is based on the Laplace matrix of the graph. And uh, this one can be generated with a uh, spectral, uh, spectrum spatial complex using the hot Laplacians. And later you can have a, a lot of model has been proposed for spectrum hypergraph. So what we try to say is that here they don't have the multi-scale information. So we add it into the filtration process. So instead of only one, graph, we have series graph, and then we study the variation and the persistence of the spectrum information during this process. So in this way, we end up into persistent, you know, spectrum graph, persistent spectrum spatial complex, and persistent spectrum hypograph. So very simply speaking, uh, here is the example. If we have this molecules, now we have this filtration process. And each filtration, I can construct the corresponding hot Laplacian matrix. Um, I, not sure if everybody is familiar with the Hodge Laplacian. Uh, very simply speaking, it's you know you have the boundary operators, and then you can use the certain you know uh, cohomology boundary uh, relations. You can get into these Hodge Laplacians. So from this filtration process, you can have this series of Hodge Laplacian metrics. And the good thing is that the eigenvalues when you calculated, you have found that the multiplicity of zero eigenvalue corresponding exactly to the Betty number. So in this way, if I take the zero eigenvalue, calculate the multiplicity, and then check the change of the multiplicity during the filtration, then I automatically get the Betty curve. You know, so you compile this barcode and this persistent multiplicity there. Uh, they, they, adding all these things together, you get into this multiplicity. So this uh, zero eigenvalue multiplicity give us the topological information. And then the non-zero eigenvalues can give you some extra uh, you know, structural information. 
reinforce the extra combinatorial and geometric information. Combine all this information together, we can try to study the you know several biological processes. The first one we study is this protein ligand binding process. So what's going on is that if I have a protein, so for example the the COVID nineteen, we try to cure the this is a problem. So what we need to do is we want to design a certain drug. And then if this drug can bind strongly to this problem, these proteins, then they will help to change the function of it. Usually by binding to a certain hotspot of it, you can you know, make the proteins either activated or inactivated. So in this way, the, the function of the protein can be changed. So the key issue for drug design is to find a uh, ligand that can bind strongly, have a relative a higher binding affinity to these systems. So our model is used to predict the binding affinity between the ligand and the drug, which is this key step in drug design. So here we consider that this uh, uh, well-maintained uh, well, uh, well data bank called PDB bind, and they have a lot of these uh, you know, uh, structures, up to 4,000 of them. And then uh, we try to have the testing set and training set well separated for you to bench up your model. Actually, there are a lot of existing models are there. You see that all these small letters here actually represent the, 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 the existing models. So you see that using the precision spectral models, we can actually outperform the existing ones. So here, this measurement using the precision correlation coefficients. So I just want to emphasize that here you see that there are something called all, uh, the auto doc, which is very uh, powerful model. Let me see where it is. <laughs> or X score is a very powerful model. It's widely used. And uh, you have this auto doc winner, which is highly popular software in this biochemistry bioinformatics for drug design. So you see uh, the, the, the persistent models can have much better performance than these existing ones. Another model that we played with is, is the rich curvature. So again, rich curvature is a uh, fundamental properties for uh, characterizing the, 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 the geometry information. Right? It's an important tool in this differential geometry. So recently, there are actually two discrete rich curvature model has been proposed. One is called Oliver rich curvature, one is Hallman rich curvature. And they can be used to characterize graph or uh, the, the geometric information of a graph or some visual complex. Very roughly speaking, uh, the, the Oliver Rich culture, uh, the positive Oliver Rich culture represents certain cluster information. So you see, you see that this big cluster here and here and here, they all have positive values. They actually correspond to the positive. So that means the positive Oliver Rich culture is corresponding to the clusters in the system. And then during the link regions, they usually have negative values. So the negative curvature region, uh, uh, Oliver Rich culture values represent the linking regions or bridge regions between the two clusters. Uh, a lot of the derivation there, I don't want to go to the detail. Roughly speaking, they are using certain uh, vessel stand distance between the two uh, probabilities. So essentially, if you want to find out the curvature for certain edge here, what they do is that they find uh, ion, the, the probability distribution uh, for this uh, atom and it's, uh, for this vertex and its uh, labors. And then also you have another probability for this atom and its labors. And then the vastness and distance is just the distance between these two probabilities and they can be used to calculate all the rich cultures. Another thing is this four-man rich cultures. It's a little bit easier. It's related to, to, to the uh, upper degree, lower degree, and the adjacent uh, uh, atoms. So um, using these ones, you can have the uh, oil rich cultures for the whole spatial complex systems. And uh, again, they are highly consistent with each other, even though the value may not be exactly the same. Uh, but uh, um, most commonly is that the positive culture find in density packed region. And the negative curvature is finally the, in this linking region between the, 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 the clusters. And uh, what we do again is trying to introduce this uh, multi scaled process by the filtration uh, operation. So you have a series of uh, structures, some complex from the filtration process. And then we calculate the, the, the curvatures, rich curvatures for each of these uh, simple complex. And then we take the properties from there using these properties and each filtration size as the features for the systems. And then we can, you know, again, build up machine learning models and uh, compile with experimental data. So again, it works quite well. 
uh, and uh, the, 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 the thing is that these three models are really highly connected with each other. As we have said, from the spectral models, we consider zero eigenvalues, they can be con connected with the uh, precision homology information, the Betty, Bet uh, Betty curve. And uh, this precision spectrum and precision Betty curve are actually also highly connected through this uh, combinatory Bochner uh, decomposition. So essentially, if you have this uh, uh, combinatory Laplacian matrix, you can decompose them into this uh, Bochner Laplacian, combinatory Bochner Laplacian, and then the leftover term is exactly the rich curvature. So in this way, they are actually all highly connected with each other. And then this, with this precision process, they can all work very well uh, for, the, for the biological studies. And uh, the last topic of my talk is related to a little bit of my uh, recent work with collaboration with Professor Wu. So we are uh, working on the persistent homology of the hypergraph. So what is the difference between hypergraph and simplicial tundra? This is uh, quite easy. Essentially speaking, is that in hy the hypergraph is made of hyper edges. So each hyper edge is just a set of vertices. So you can have any number of uh, vertices, they form a set, and then this set is a hyper edge. So I have a three atom here, they can form a hyper edge. The trouble here is that when we have the hyper edge, if we directly do the boundary operator, then we end up into trouble. For example, here we have this three atom, three, three, three vertices, they form a hyper edge. If you do the boundary operator, then you see these two, they actually do not form a hyper edge. So after the boundary operation, they are not, uh, they are not closed. You don't have atom over there. So in this way, the boundary operator is well, not well defined. The traditional boundary operator is not well defined in the hypergraph. So Professor Wu has proposed certain uh, called a, uh, inferior and superior chain group by removing or adding some extra uh, component into the system, and then they can prove that they have the consistent uh, result for the homology uh, definitions. And we use these ideas again for the protein systems, the interactions between the uh, the, the systems. Again, uh, what we're trying to do is, is model this interaction as a hypergraph and then find out the corresponding persistent homology and the, the barcode and we use this one to, to, to study the systems. They all work quite well in these systems. They can, they can uh, outperform existing models, uh, you know, in, in, in this uh, with traditional descriptors. So just to quickly summarize what we do. Uh, again, it's trying to uh, come up with certain structural representations, structure distributors, and uh, we we using certain you know geometric environment and topological environment, and we are also interested to try some combinatory environment, and then combined with the physical properties, some from electrostatic, some from hydrophobic, and then put them together, throw into machine learning as a features, and then uh, apply uh, benchmark them or validate them using uh, biological real biological data. And uh, that's basically all for my talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So before we get to questions, let's uh, briefly unmute ourselves and uh, applaud for clean. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the speaker? Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, very nice talk. Thank you so much. So there's so much interesting information here. The, the main thing that I'm interested in is this spectral uh, theory that you uh, described that related Hodge theory and the Ricci flow. Um, you had a very nice slide where you gave the, the overview of the relationship. And I'm, I'm interested in sort of higher eigenvalues and oscillatory phenomena. Can you, uh, and, and, I sort of roughly understand how that projects down to the gauss bonnet theorem, but I don't really fully understand it, to be honest, right? because you have this different uh, Laplace decomposition. Can you say something about, about uh, higher eigenvalues in this picture? This may be, I'm sorry about the rambly question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. So uh, essentially speaking is that you can construct this hot Laplacian matrix from the simplicial complex, right, based on the cohomology ideas. And then the eigenvalues there can be used to relate it to the number of zero eigenvalues is corresponding to the number. 
that's the right. So th here. that I understand, but what happens with the higher order ones, right? So that's what's interesting. You you mean like petty one and petty two higher order? No, 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 not not the petty, the eigenvalues, right? So the serious eigenvalue is going to give you the homology. What happens to the other ones? The eigenvalues, uh, the zero eigenvalues correspond to have homology, right? So petty zero, petty one, petty right. two, of course you have L0, L1, and L2. They give you petty right. zero, petty one, and petty two through the eigenvalues. That's, the, that's what we have over here. And then only right. this side is the difference between the two uh, uh, Laplace matrix. Actually, this one is the uh, combinatorial Laplace matrix. This is the Bohler combinatorial Laplace and their difference is by the rich cultures. Yeah, so actually the risk culture is very simple. I don't go to data. So if you check on the detail, what's going on here is that this is the upper degree. This is the lower degree. So if we're K simplex, the lower degree is always K plus one. The upper degree is the, is the one that it, is, it, it works as a, as a, as a co-phase. And then this is the, 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 the what they call the parallel one. Yeah, so this is, will give you exactly the, the, the formal risk culture. So if you want to see it more clearly in the matrix, so what's going on is that, so for the, this diagonal matrix, so this is exactly upper degree, this is exactly a lower degree. So you have this term and then you have the one negative one, you just add them together, use this one to minus them. You get, uh, you get all the results. Yeah, for the rich culture. For, uh, for the okay. four man rich culture. I understand, <laughs> I understand where the higher harmonics are hidden. They're basically, they're, they're hidden on the left side, and because they don't change the topology, Gauss Bonnet gives you the invariance down to the homology. So, okay, awesome. Thank you so much. I gotta have to read up on this. I don't know enough, but this is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, this is Ira. I have a question. Actually, you might have mentioned, it, but you have a paper on precision homology and molecular representation. What did that multiplicative structure get you? Because you you just you concentrate on homology in here. When you when you used cohomology in your other work, what did it get you in terms of the molecular structure that you didn't have with just homology, please? So the cohomology part is that you can have some extra weight you defined on that. That extra weight can be choosing from certain extra properties. So, uh, for example, uh, here in the traditional graph theories, they can have low degree defined a certain load and the shortest path. These same similar ideas can be defined on simplex. So using the cohomology, you have this extra weighting information that uh, uh, you can incorporate this extra weighting information that can be related to the property you mentioned here. So in this way, they can give you a little bit more information just can, than the uh, passing homology. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. May I ask a question? Please do. Um, I am curious about uh, your opinion about the role of uh, uh, group actions uh, in your approach. Is there any role for group actions? That's a very good question. So we seriously believe it will be a lot of importance there. So the, you know, the symmetry information is very important in the molecular systems, but currently we have not using too much of the tools there. Yeah, so we are trying to explore some of the possibility of using these tools. Yeah, so, so I, I, I saw some of your very interesting papers. We are still trying to understand a lot of details and then play the games. Yeah, essentially is that how to, we're trying to see how, how to uh, make it into uh, algorithms and apply into these systems. So if you have any suggestions, we very good, yeah. I, I, I'm also maybe a, a philosophical question, maybe mm. just a silly question, but anyway, uh, do you see any uh, geometrical method? We have a lot of information, a lot of uh, also, a lot of geometrical information. Uh, how do you think that we could select the right information from a geometrical point of view, apart from machine learning? I mean, when we have a problem, how could we select the right method in geometry, the right uh, geometrical information to face problems, uh, for example, in, in comparison of, of data? 
Uh, exactly, it's a very good question. So in fact, geometric information uh, uh, originally was widely used in the biomolecular system. So for example, they in the, in the MD molecular dynamic, molecular dynamic uh, simulations, they use the bound lens, dihedral angle, bound angle, all these are geometric information. And then when they started certain solvation process, they needed to generate a surface like uh, Herbert as, uh, as Brewer, they do a lot of this called molecular surface related things. They have a solvent accessible, solvent uh, exclusive, all kinds of different geometric model to define the surface. And when they define the surface, they can try to find out a concave region, convex region that usually have certain uh, biological meaning. For example, the convex region are usually related to the binding spot, the, the, the potential place for the drug to bind to it. So in this way, actually geometric models are more widely used in the, uh, in the biological systems. And they can, as, as just said, they can be used in different applications. Some are for the surface representation. Some are more in the like MD force field um, terms. And some are more sometimes maybe in the density representation. And they also have a lot of uh, geometric tools out there. The trouble is that we think geometric model sometimes tend to be too much. They have a, a little bit, uh, they have some extra information and the calculation uh, can be a little bit more uh, complex. So the TDA is much precise, much clear. And uh, another thing is that the un they don't have the unit issue too. Yeah, so, so in this way, they may have better combination with uh, this learning model, but for the physical models, that's a lot of things to explore. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question, if that's okay. So um, it's a question related to using topological descriptors, um, particularly for, say, molecular data. So uh, in general, right, there could be very different shapes that have the same persistence diagrams, or at least they have very similar persistence diagrams. But that's, you know, shapes in general that you could just invent but say particularly for molecular data and the data that you've seen have you observed that um very different kinds of molecules produce either the same or really similar uh topological invariants or, or do you notice as a whole that um it does a good job of separating out different types and structures of molecular data very good question. So in fact, a lot of the structures, different structures may have exactly the same uh, Betty bars. For example, I, I only showed F900, right? If you check about F900, uh, like 50, 45, uh, you know, 40, uh, more than this one to the F1000, all these configurations, as long as they have this straight line, usually they will have very similar barcodes. They will have the same Betty, uh, Betty zero corresponding to the bound lens. And then there are no extra Betty one information or very small Betty one information corresponding to the, uh, what they call the uh, nuclear acid residues. Other than that, the rest are the same. So the persistent barcode cannot differentiate a lot of the structures. Uh, stay differently, many different uh, structures can have exactly the same persistent barcode. However, here you see, this structure is made of all kinds of atoms. In the whole, even in the geometric model, they can have different ways to select different part for analysis. For example, they can use like a, a, what they call the bound atom, they have the residue part. So in the TDA, what we actually do is decompose the structure into various atom combinations. For example, we can have atom, <coughs> oxygen atom, carbon atom, uh, nitrogen atom, hydrogen atoms, so on and so forth. And then we can check the topology within these atom combinations. So in this way, you have a much larger degree of freedom to discretize more complicated in the connectivities. So in this way, if even the two structures that are originally cannot differentiate by just one barcode, you can decompose them into many structures and then check a series of barcode, then you will see the difference. Yeah. That, that's Where really interesting. Um, just as a, a quick uh, follow-up. So in this, mm -hmm. say, on the pictures on the screen, what would mm -hmm. it look like to discretize? Would you just restrict yourself to only atoms of a particular type or? 
you, you can do that. There are many different ways to do that. Mm. For example, here, I only take the, this, uh, maybe the yellow color ones. Uh, mm. This may be not good because I, I decompose this one. I color them in terms of residue, but usually you can check only the, uh, the certain atom type. For example, carbon carbon atoms are usually highly related to hydrophobic, hydrophilic. They have this uh, uh, specific chemical meanings. So if you check the network from the carbon carbon uh, interactions, you actually can see some hydrophilic or hydrophobic related information. And then you can take carbon and oxygen, then you can see some other informations. And then sometimes you can see certain, say you can certain local informations, right? Certain reaction domain, or you just take a certain part uh, region that you are specifically interested. In. So you have many different ways to go into the details uh, and get more barcodes for you to differentiate them. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, could I ask a question also? Sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I I think it's actually a follow up of uh, of this, this this picture here. Um, you know, it seems like what you you are saying is that I started with an initial line, and um, you know, this entire um, you know, molecule, and I get one signature, and I'm going to decompose the space by, you know, um, atom types, or decompose like by spatial decomposition, and then you will get um, more barcodes. Um, and then this leads to an interesting question: is that is there at some point the information is going to saturate? Um, you know, I mean, it, it would be, I think, somehow from. Uh, from an information theory perspective, it feels like at some point you are going to kind of run through all the possible combinations and so on and so forth. And I'm just trying to get that in a sense that, you know, when do you think this operation is sufficient, right? Because I, I think like from practical perspective, you have, you know, you have some sort of, I don't know, classification accuracy you're trying to beat on, right? So, uh, but when do we think it's enough in terms of try to kind of get as many different kind of, uh, how to say, barcode as possible. Is there like a sense of when it's sufficient and when it's not, right? I mean, I know it's a little bit more like a philosophical question, but it's like, seems like there is some sort of limit uh, where you will eventually reach. So I wonder if you can comment on that. Very good question, actually. Yeah, so we actually uh, have some thought about that because there are definitely various different way of combination. But we are usually, uh, we didn't actually go from the, the information type of way. Maybe <laughs> if you interest me, we can work together on these things. We are actually approaching it from more physical way, put in this way. So for example, if you just check about the carbon-carbon interactions, you, what you are see is that, the, for example, or if you, could call, you see this one is more careful. So here you see all the barcodes are actually at 3.8 astron because I'm taking the C alpha atom. The distance between the two C alpha atoms is exactly 3.8, around 3.8 astron. And here you see all the bars are actually one to two astron, right? This is the common covalent bond interactions. So by taking different combinations, you can see exactly what are the covalent bond, what are the non-covalent bond, what are the C alpha, C alpha relation covalent bond? So these have exactly physical meanings and biological meanings. So we are actually driven by trying to say, okay, if we are interested in this kind of covalent bond interaction, what are the suitable atom combination we want to check? If we want to say, okay, certain hydrophobic, hydrophilic type of interaction, then maybe we choose certain related uh, the in uh, interactions, but definitely, you point out a very good way. So if we, informatically, maybe there should be certain, you know, uh, you know, suitable way to to make it to make them mathematically more elegant. Yeah, that will be very good. Yeah. So I'm yeah, very happy. We can maybe talk more later. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pei. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's a really really interesting thing. Somehow, you know, if there is a connection, then it would mean that if you go beyond what is physically meaningful, maybe that is well hypothetically conjecture to be where the information was saturated. Oh, or maybe you start picking up things that is no longer uh, physically, how to say, justifiable, um, but those signatures wouldn't necessarily be useful. But I don't know, those, those are, I think, interesting questions to ask here, so. 
exactly, exactly, totally agree. So another thing you, you can pay attention is actually, for example, like the, the Fourier molecular I mentioned, this one only have carbon atom. But for protein, usually what you have is oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and sometimes sulfur. But for DNA, it's different. The DNA, you have oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and the, the, the phosphine, P atom over there. So the atom combination are actually quite different. So as you mentioned, maybe there should be some informatic way to dig into a little bit more into these things to say maybe DNA have more possibility to accumulate more uh, you know, information than protein, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, could I ask a question? Yes, do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I have a question. Is there any in, uh, any um, energetic information in the persistent homology or computing? So can you tell which conformations are more likely? Uh, very good one. So uh, so here. Uh, we are trying at the beginning, we try to establish a certain physical meaning like what we do here. So what we try to do is that use Betty 2 as a way to approximate the curvature energy. So uh, essentially speaking, if they're more uh, into uh, uh, I isotropic, uh, they're more into a, a, a regular sphere, then they have a, a low energy. So in a low energy means they're more stable. They are easy to find in the natural environment. Mm -hmm. But if they have a higher curvature energy, usually it's very hard for them to generate. And if they are high energy, they tend to be unstable. So this is the very limited work we do for the isomers. And for proteins, uh, usually these ones, the 3D structures are the highly stable ones. So what happened in the real systems, actually they go from straight line into a well-folded 3D structure, which is more stable. In the, uh, Energy-wise, I think it's possible to build up a certain um, energy functionnel based on the based on the barcode. But uh, here, there should be a lot of parameter to be tuning. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I think Ross Assad is going to ask a question. Go ahead. All right. Let me read it for him. So. Avras asks, have you done any work regarding the use of TDA for different conformations of the same molecule? Because one can have different conformations or rotations of the same molecule, but uh, not necessarily all conformers of the same molecule are active molecules. Uh, yes, we have done some work over there. So essentially, the, we are trying to, but we approach the problem from the flexibility point of view. So essentially, if the structure uh, and the thermal fluctuations, they try to have, uh, you know, uh, jiggling or wiggling of the structures. And then some part will fluctuate more dramatically. For example, if I'm standing here, I put my hand outside, right? My hand is not, uh, uh, you know, that close to my, my major body, then they tend to uh, fluctuate more in this situation. So that can be measured by something called B factor. So we, we are, do a lot of work trying to understand, the, trying to, uh, predict the B factor of the protein structure. And then B factor, if you have a larger value, means it's highly flexible. That part can contribute more to the, to the configurations. And then some part are more stable, are more rigid. So these are the part have lower B factors. There are some model we have done uh, very earlier along this line. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Clean, for the fantastic talk. And thanks to everybody in the audience for the engaging questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.